All right, guys. It is just a god awful nasty midwinter day here in mid October here in the collapse of everything here at Bugs in a Jar Farm in New York, baby, where I see on the weather map about 30 miles north of here it is snowing. It is snowing half, not even quite halfway through October on Monday. October 14th, 2024, I believe, and I am sad to report that I actually have some guy checking in here to this converted tool shed with the heater, and I'm going to be banished to my igloo up the hill here in a few minutes. So I hope I have time to get this long essay, and we're going to go little bit out on a limb today. Uh, we're going to get a little bit radical for this channel. A little bit radical from the left end of the spectrum. Uh, this fellow, I might have read from him before, a fellow named Paul Street. <coughs> I found uh, Paul's latest uh, essay here on that little lefty outfit called Counterpunch. And uh, as I say, uh, this is a long slog. If I get a phone call halfway through it, I'm just going to cut it off here and you can pick it up from wherever my phone call came in. But we're going to let Paul Street tell us about manufacturing, manufacturing inurement manufacturing annurement, normalizing madness and catastrophe. Um, live streamed genocide inflicted by Israel and its sugar daddy the United States and Gaza, repeat, replete with regular images of dead Palestinian children being pulled from the rubble produced by American-made bombs, and now a vicious Israel-U.S. assault on Lebanon, possibly spiraling into a mass murderous regional war across the Middle East? A seemingly endless meat grinder of a U.S.-provoked inter-imperialist proxy war in Ukraine? with regular images of mass destruction and death and the ever-present heightened risk of nuclear war? More people killed and towns leveled by recurrent outbreaks of unprecedented extreme weather clearly resulting from the heedless U.S.-led carbon capitalist project of turning the planet into a giant greenhouse gas chamber. This as predicted by climate scientists who have been warning us for years about the dire consequences of the reckless mass extraction and burning of fossil fuels. Masses of people turned into desperate migrants trying to flee social, environmental, economic, and political disasters produced by the U.S.-led imperialist order. Yet another mass shooting in the armed madhouse that is the contemporary U.S., home to 115 guns for every 100 people. The takeover of one of the nation's two dominant political parties by a truth-crushing Christian white nationalist neo-fascist movement that is ready, willing, and able to overthrow previously and long normative bourgeois electoral and rule of law democracy such as it is. Oh well, whatever. That's how it is. That's life. Let's not get all crazy and radical about things. It is what it is. Nothing I can change. None of my business. 
What's for dinner? One of the different manufacturing consent roles of the capitalist state media is to inure, I-N-U-R-E, is to inure masses of people to the lethal insanity of the capitalist imperialist system. Let's call it manufacturing inurement. In your I N U R E, spelled E N U R E in British English, is a clever and underestimated word. Merriam Webster online defines it as follows To accustom people to accept something undesirable, as in children inured to violence. Words thesaurus function brings up these wor these words as related and similar to inure. Harden, toughen, accustom, season, habituate, acclimatize, desensitize, naturalize. I might add deaden and normalize. We are seeing this key mass media function, manufacturing inurement in operation quite a bit these days. Take Donald clear out the Marxist vermin Trump and the U.S. presidential election. Here we are again for the third quadrennial electrical, uh, elect, electoral extravaganza in a row with one of the nation's two major and viable parties running a malignant narcissist and fascist lunatic. Donald poisoning our blood Trump for the most powerful and dangerous office on earth. An office this demented maniac actually held between 2017 and 2021. Almost every day brings a new insane comment, lie, and promise from this unspeakable ogre, this adjudicated sex offender who openly channels Adolf Hitler. The other party, that other party, is running a blood-soaked imperialist and longtime mass incarcerator who backs genocidal ethnic cleansing in Gaza and promises to keep the United States military, quote, the most lethal killing force on the planet. Killer Kamala joins the Fatherland Party, the Republic Fascist, in backing draconian nativist barriers for Latin Americans trying to escape the hell that U.S. imperialism has made of, has made of life for millions in their home countries. Both parties and their candidates are committed to a growth-addicted, fossil capitalist imperialist system that is canceling prospects for a decent future and raising the specter of human extinction via the deepening climate catastrophe and or nuclear war. Never mind the images of dead children buried in hospital rubble caused by U.S.-made 200-pound bombs. Never mind the image of whole towns destroyed by wildfires and floods, burnt and drowned corpses on display as capitalism turns the planet into a lethal oven. Never mind the weather maps showing three new hurricanes forming in the dangerously warmed Gulf of Mexico. This is all treated across the dominant U.S. mass media 
as things to which we are to be accustomed, acclimated, desensitized, familiarized, seasoned, and deadened, otherwise inured. An ecocidal, capitalist, imperialist, fascist party running malevolent Nazis is presented as the latest version of our nation's conservative politics. An ecocidal, capitalist, imperialist, bourgeois, democratic party running a faux progressive, genocide apologist and warmonger ready to tip the world ever closer to nuclear war with Russia is reported as the liberal, even left alternative, you know, calling Kamala Harris a leftist is like calling Sancho Panza a pit bull. Uh, inuring us to the extreme destructiveness and oppression of the system is a big part of what our, meaning the ruling classes, media is all about. Its mission includes accustoming us to the sociopathic class rule and anarchy of capitalism imperialism. It is about getting masses to shrug their shoulders and say, well, that's how things go, or that's the way it is. The iconic CBS newscaster Walter Cronkite's NAS nightly news sign-off during my 1960s childhood, and or what else is new, or oh well, as despicable horrors unfold before our eyes, if we even bother to look anymore. And just an aside, did you guys realize that Walter Cronkite was a serious doomer? Walter Cronkite, a major doomer. Of course, he had to be kept on a short leash talking about, talking about walking in two worlds. Uh, Walter Cronkite, <clears throat> any radical criticism of this insanity is labeled as, well, extremism and therefore as beyond the parameters of acceptable debate. Let's not get extreme, and if what the capitalist imperialist system and its top power, the United States, are doing to the world isn't extreme. To quote the revolutionary communist leader Bob, Bob Avakian, from a 2015 lecture he gave on revolutionary theory and practice, quote, let's not have things get extreme as if it's not extreme what is happening with the environment. Remember, this was 2015. As if it's not extreme what is happening to women all over the world and as if it's not extreme what is happening to people in the inner cities with the police and with their conditions overall. And if it's not extreme what's happening with immigrants being driven thousands of miles from one part of the world to another because of wars and overall desperate conditions, and if it's not extreme with people being blown apart by bombs in all these different countries where wars are going on. Oh no, let's not have things become too extreme. <clears throat> Close quote. The liberal Russian emigre and political commentator Marsh Masha Gessen recently reflected on the mass media's normalization of extreme insanity in a New York Times column 
on the recent televised debate between the fascist vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance and the Weimar Dems vice, president, vice presidential candidate Tim Walz. As Gessen notes, the debate's CBS moderators agreed in advance not to fact check the serial liar Vance and asked questions that gave credence to Trump's totally ridiculous claim that Waltz, quote, supports abortions in the ninth month. The debate hosts created false equivalents between A. Vance's preposterous Leviathan lies that Trump saved Obamacare that the 2020 presidential election was stolen, that January 6 was a peaceful protest, that Haitians are eating people's pets in Springfield, Ohio, you know, on one hand, and B, Walls' mistaken or fibbed statement on where he was during China's Tiananmen Square crackdown, as if A, and B were remotely equal. Quote, Gessen writes, when you place lies and facts on an even footing, it basically creates a political sphere in which there is no fact-based reality. That is a pre-totalitarian condition. You cannot have politics if you don't have a shared reality and if you don't place an absolute value on the truth. I think that normalization degrades our political life and degrades our understanding of politics. What I think their thinking was, and I can only conjecture, but their thinking was probably... We have one candidate who is in the habit of lying, as is his running mate. Let's find a way that we can show that we're equal, equally critical of both candidates. It's a classic false equivalence. Walls is talking about his time in Hong Kong and possibly uh, fizz, fibbing possibly misremembering, but it is a minor, minor thing in his background versus Vance's out and out lies about an actual insurrection and actual violent attack on our institutions of state. To put them on the same level is absurd as guess and more than suggest the media is inuring U.S. citizens to serial lying by their, meaning the ruling classes, politicians. Also in the New York Times, the environmental writer David Wallace Wells recently published an op-ed offering the following dark reflections on why the U.S. slept through Hurricane Helene, failing to adequately prepare for and properly process the incredible destructiveness of the capitalogenic storm. Quoting this long quote from David Wallace Wells in the New York Times, quote, Last week, warning about the imminent arrival of Hurricane Helene, the National Weather Service in Tallahassee, Florida, used the word unsurvivable. And yet, the, so the storm seemed to take much of the country by surprise. You might have thought not that long ago that the arrival of extreme weather could wake us up belatedly, from climate complacency. But the dull drumbeat of disaster seems almost to be putting us to sleep instead. Even the imminent arrival 
of a cataclysm like Helene, a Category 4 storm that spanned more than 400 miles across the Gulf Coast and threatened communities in as far north as Appalachia was not enough to generate all that much attention ahead of time when more might have been done to limit the devastation. Soon enough, the storm claimed a foothold on the country's front pages and in the national consciousness, but by then it was hard to escape the impression that as natural disasters and extreme weather events pile up in our feeds, they are somewhat losing their salience as a cultural force producing less a sense of ruptured reality than more quotidian disruption, even receding from view as a perverse consequence of ubiquitousness. Back-to-back -back hurricanes, thousand-year floods, the return of the urban firestorm, Many of these grim disasters seem to loom larger as horrifying long-term predictions that they do as actual weather events that are presently leaving whole populations devastated in their wake. There was relief action the tragedy of Helene is not that nobody arrived in its wake to help because people have. The tragedy is that the storm did more and got there first. The pattern by now familiar, but the country has seemingly chosen not to be prepared as much as grow inured, close quote. Thank you, David. Back to, uh, to Paul. Just for the record, I settled on working with the word inure before I read Wallace Wells' excellent commentary and was pleasantly surprised to see that it is the last word in his column. Anyway, thank you, Paul Street. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to let Paul Street's uh, little rant lie right there. And uh, like me, you can choose which parts of that essay to uh, take under consideration and which parts of it to roll your eyes to and move on through your doom scrolling or your cute cat videos or whatever. But I gotta wrap this up because I have someone coming in to this converted tool shed I need to get the heat turned on at 3 o'clock in the afternoon while I still can. Now I got some bad news, little dog. Get ready to, little Miss Muffet is ready to get off your tuffet. Because we got to go up and freeze our ass for three nights in Blue Dragon. Oh boy. Three nights in the igloo. My guys. 